The drone of aircraft engines fills the skies above a battered continent. It is the summer of 1940, and war has cast its shadow across Europe. Above the fields of southern England, lines of spitfires and hurricanes leap into the sunlight, the fate of Britain riding squarely on their wings. But beneath the iconic camouflage, beneath the roar and thunder, lies one crucial detail only a handful of insiders truly comprehend. The propeller, a slender spiral of wood and metal, spinning so fast it nearly vanishes, quietly carrying the hopes of a nation. In the heart of this technological drama stands one man, a quietly brilliant engineer whose name seldom finds its way into museum displays or history textbooks. Yet his work, a breakthrough propeller design, will help decide the outcome of the world's greatest conflict. Setting the historical stage. The story of VOTU aerial combat often focuses on the pilots, young, brash, holding their nerve against impossible odds. Their machines, the Spitfire and the Hurricane, represent the pinnacle of British engineering. Posters and headlines celebrate the men and their aircraft, but it's what happens behind closed factory doors and drafting tables that determines the shape of battle. Enter the Air Ministry, tasked with a desperate mission, preserve Britain against the German Luftwaffe's relentless assault. The brass knows their fighters need every technological edge. Designers race to squeeze more power from engines, shave pounds from airframes, improve armor. But one basic, crucial problem keeps haunting the engineering teams, propeller efficiency. Traditional fixed-pitch propellers restrict performance, either optimized for climbing power or for speed, but never both. With dogfights raging from low altitudes to high, every second counts, and every limitation becomes a risk. Thus, a challenge lands on a single engineer's desk. Can the propeller itself be transformed from a simple spinner to a sophisticated, adaptable tool? The answer will radically reshape not only one aircraft, but the entire aerial contest. Introducing the engineer, innovation in silence. Frank Whittle, Stanley Hooker, Frederick Lanchester, many names echo across British aviation, but in the quiet offices at Rotol, one man stands apart. Arthur John Hyde, senior engineer, has spent years pondering fluid dynamics and the fragile border between speed, lift, and noise. Hyde's genius is not in radical new materials, but in finding elegant ways to make old principles work better than anyone believed possible. Hyde considers the variable pitch propeller, an idea most dismissed as too complex for mass production, too prone to mechanical failure. Yet he's convinced that, with meticulous attention to detail and the right manufacturing tolerances, it can be made robust, reliable, and powerful. His team sketches prototypes with adjustable blades, able to rotate and change their angle in pitch as the aircraft transitions between climb and horizontal flight. These are no mere drawings. Hyde builds test rigs, orders thousands of hours of wind tunnel experiments, and computes the dynamic stresses by hand late into the night. The genesis of Rotol and the technical battleground Rotol, a compound of Rolls-Royce and Bristol, becomes the home of Hyde's vision. Here he leads a team through sleepless months, guiding draftsmen, machinists, and testers in the pursuit of a stronger, smarter propeller. The core innovation is hydraulic actuation, oil pressure mechanisms that turn each blade independently, providing near instant adaptation to the pilot's needs. Early trials are rocky, cogs slip, leaks develop, and blades snap under the enormous torque generated by the new engines. Hyde refuses to give up. He tweaks clearances, recuts gear teeth, demands higher quality materials, and personally supervises each test flight. The breakthrough comes as the Battle of Britain looms. Repair crews swap out old wooden props for the gleaming new Rotol devices. Instantly, pilots notice the difference. Acceleration improves, climb rates increase, and maximum speed jumps by critical miles per hour. The pilot can set course pitch for takeoff, then shift to fine for cruise, no longer shackled to a single setting. Pilot's perspective, the edge in a dogfight. Squadron leader Mark Buzz Hill sits in the cockpit, hurtling towards enemy bombers. He's flown the old fixed pitch Spitfire and now the upgraded version. He describes it. With the variable pitch prop, the machine leaps into the air like a wild hawk. You climb faster, you chase harder, and when you open the throttle, the nose doesn't dip. You go straight for the sky. The difference is not merely mechanical, it's psychological. Pilots know they have an edge, 
and squadron morale grows as bruised units notch victories against technically superior German aircraft. Reports filter back to the war office, shot down Luftwaffe bombers, safe returns, missions flown again and again with minimal mechanical failures. Production and the strains of war. Manufacture victory in Britain's skies depends not only on design, but on production. Hyde and Rotol fight a battle of logistics, securing strategic medals in the face of blockade, training assembly line workers to precise tolerances, rushing deliveries to airfields under threat of bombing. Every propeller is stamped and tested. Hydraulic units are shipped in kettles of oil to guarantee cleanliness. Inspectors pour over each unit for hairline fractures or bends. Blades are balanced to within fractions of a gram. Legend grows that the Spitfire propeller can take a glancing hit and still bring its pilot home. Hyde's propellers earn respect not for their glamour, but for their reliability and resilience. British newspapers begin to mention the engineering marvel, and pilots credit their survival to the quiet men in the factory. Technological arms race. The German response across the channel, German engineers scramble to catch up. Messerschmitts and Focke Wolfs receive their own variable pitch systems, but these are often clumsier, heavier, or prone to breakdown. Luftwaffe pilots grumble at sluggish climb performance, blaming their mechanical teams. Hyde studies captured enemy designs, noting overcomplicated hydraulic circuits and brittle gears. He shares notes with RAF intelligence, subtly guiding countermeasures and pilot tactics. Technical deep dive, principles of pitch and power. At its core, the variable pitch propeller transforms the aircraft's power curve. Traditional props operate best at a single setting, maximize climb or maximize cruise, but not both. Hyde's design uses angle adjustment from cockpit controls, allowing, allowing pilots to dynamically choose their best compromise. Climb pitch, blades turn for low speed, high power ascent. More air is bitten, propelling the fighter skyward. Cruise pitch, at altitude, the angle flattens to maximize speed and fuel efficiency. Combat, pilots can tweak pitch mid-flight, optimizing for pursuit, escape, or rapid maneuvers. Hydraulic actuation ensures changes occur smoothly with minimal pilot effort. Metal fatigue, vibration harmonics, and oil pressure science become daily language for Hyde's crew. Engineering drama, risks, and triumphs. Not all is smooth sailing. In early missions, oil leaks cause blade locking, sending pilots to forced landings. Saboteurs attempt to disrupt the factories. Hyde faces down bureaucratic skepticism and the ever-present fear of failure. In the darkest weeks of the war, Rotol works around the clock, with blackout curtains drawn against Luftwaffe night raids. Workers joke that Hyde sleeps in the test hangar, his pillow a propeller blade. Each successful sortie becomes proof that real victory is built not only in the skies, but in the sweat and ingenuity of engineers. The Turning Point, Battle of Britain and Tactical Advantage as the weeks wore on and the German aerial offensive intensified, the advantage provided by Rotol's variable pitch propeller became ever more apparent. Experienced pilots described gaining precious altitude and speed in the crucial seconds separating life from death. The Battle of Britain was, in many ways, a contest of attrition and efficiency. Luftwaffe pilots, pushing their engines to the limit, sometimes found themselves outmatched, not by greater firepower, but by smarter engineering. Stories abounded in squadron mess halls of pilots who, thanks to the variable pitch prop, could outclim their pursuers, break through the combat ceiling, or accelerate over the channel to safety. The new technology's reliability under duress, when every turn of the blade might decide victory or defeat, earned it a reputation not just as an engineering marvel, but as a symbol of British resolve. Production at scale, war's relentless demands. War is never won in laboratories alone. Recognizing the propeller's critical role, the Ministry of Aircraft Production threw its full weight behind scaling up Rotol's operations. Hundreds of machinists worked double and triple shifts. Materials were prioritized as a matter of national survival. The threat of sabotage, the danger of air raids, and the fatiguing repetition of factory life became everyday companions for those on the production line. However, morale rarely faltered. The workers understood that every blade balanced, every hydraulic assembly perfectly calibrated, was another fighter in the air, another chance to turn back the enemy. Many left personal marks on components, a penciled note, 
a scratched-in wish for safe return, humanizing technology with the hopes of a nation. Engineering culture, lessons in resilience leadership within Rotol, inspired by Arthur Hyde's relentless energy and ingenuity, fostered an engineering culture based on continuous learning and resilience. Each setback, be it a snap blade in a mock dogfight or a glitch in hydraulic pressure at high altitudes, became a shared lesson, not a cause for blame. Record keeping grew fanatical. Every test logged, every solution evaluated, every mistake documented and recycled into improvement. The engineers and workers became a family, bound by common cause and nightly shared meals under blackout skies. Test pilots risked their lives to push new iterations of the propeller to the breaking point. Their feedback, at times blunt, often creative, informed every decision in the design room. Through it all, Hyde became both mentor and legend. His rare public addresses, usually given at 3 a.m. around a factory boiler, reminded his team that their work, though unseen by the public, set the fates of thousands. Expanding the legacy, global ramifications. As the Battle of Britain faded into myth, the war expanded across continents. Rotol's propellers, now refined, were installed in more than just spitfires and hurricanes. They found their way into bombers, reconnaissance planes, and new generations of fighters. Allied engineers from the United States to Australia requested blueprints, technical consultancy, and even staff secondments to replicate Rotol's success for their own aircraft. Innovation bred more innovation. American manufacturers inspired by Rotol principles developed their own iterations, further accelerating Allied air superiority in theaters from the Pacific to North Africa and beyond. By 1944, variable pitch technology was no longer cutting edge. It was a baseline standard, and the operational doctrine for air forces worldwide had forever changed. Life and death on the edge, human stories. Yet, amid statistics and technical triumphs, Individual stories brought the propeller's impact to life. In the spring of 1942, a young Canadian pilot, Jack Munro, found himself locked in a deadly climb with a Messerschmitt over deep. His Spitfire, fitted with the new propeller, gained altitude faster than his German adversary, enabling him to deliver the fateful shot that saved his squadron. Later, he wrote that it wasn't his skill or courage making the difference, but some clever soul back at the factory who kept thinking while the rest of us slept. Factory workers wept openly when they learned their propellers had saved local boys, many of whom lived in nearby towns or were relatives. Engineering moved from abstraction to reality, its impact measured in lives rather than prototypes. The post-war world and the propeller's enduring influence. When victory in Europe was finally declared, Hyde and his team were summoned to London not for medals, but for debriefings. Military strategists and government advisors wanted to know what made Rotol's system different, why it had failed so rarely, and enabled such agility. The process of demobilization saw many of Hyde's best minds scattered to industry, academia, and a world hungry for peacetime technology. But the legacy of the war-winning propeller persisted. Beyond aviation, the principles developed at Rotol from rapid prototyping to systematic testing and the vital connection between frontline users and designers became the gold standard for British engineering projects for decades. Variable pitch propeller concepts were adapted for civilian transport, maritime vessels, and even wind turbines, their genetic markings a tribute to war-forged necessity. Reassessing the engineer's role, humility, and impact, Arthur Hyde, the man at the center of this quiet revolution, never sought the limelight. His wartime diaries, later discovered by historians, reveal an unwavering belief in the invisible hand of engineering, that true heroes of any conflict are those who solve problems that save lives without expectation of applause. In a rare interview, Hyde remarked, history remembers the pilot who won the battle, not the draftsman who sharpened his pencil at midnight. Yet both must do their parts, or history veers another way. The humility resonated deeply throughout the profession. Young engineers entering the field often cited Hyde as the paragon of dedication and silent influence. The philosophy of innovation, the Rotol story became a case study in how focused innovation, fast learning from failure, and relentless pursuit of reliability can tip the balance in crises. Unlike the stereotypical lone genius, the team at Rotol embodied collective intelligence.
designers, machinists, test pilots, and service crews adapting together in real time. Their advances did not arise from theoretical perfection, but from an unwavering commitment to getting it right, over and over, until functionality matched need. It was, in effect, the antithesis of wartime propaganda, quiet competence, not bombast, leading the way. Remembering the forgotten, museum and memorial decades later, a small corner of the Imperial War Museum would finally display the Rotol variable pitch propeller, its plaque quietly stating, the design that helped win the skies. Veterans visiting the exhibit often found themselves overcome by memories of the blade's familiar hum, of pilots lost and saved, of nights spent welding and balancing, and dreaming of peace. For school children, the artifact is simply intriguing. For the few remaining factory workers or pilots, it is a symbol that can be achieved when intellect and effort are united in the face of adversity. Coda, lessons for the future. In aviation, the days of the propeller have long since given way to the jet turbine. Yet the Rotol story remains a beacon, a lesson embedded in engineering textbooks and management seminars alike. It underscores the power of bold ideas, endless testing, and collaboration across disciplines. The simple, elegant variable pitch propeller, a device that turned allied fortunes at their darkest hour, reminds us that wars are not only fought by those in the headlines, but by every person who brings imagination, discipline, and heart to the table. Every invention, no matter how humble, can alter the destiny of nations. As new generations face new challenges, the Rotol legacy whispers a timeless truth. Progress is made by those who refuse to accept limits.